Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. This is a non-judgmental place to explore spirituality, and we're so glad you're here. This is a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we greatly appreciate your support. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Be sure and like, share, and subscribe to any of the social media content platforms that you're using. And then if you go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, you can make a one-time donation or with a monthly subscription, you'll gain access to our bonus content. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. All right. Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. We're so glad you're tuning in with us um, today. And by the way, this is the second time I've interviewed. So I've only been doing this podcast for a little over two years, Tom, and I've only had a few guests back a second time. Oh, I'm honored. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to have you back not only a second time, but maybe even do a series down the line with you on a, on a series of questions that I might do with you and a, a Buddhist friend and a rabbi friend. Good. Kind of ask, you know, questions around some of the stuff that you bring up to get three different views on it, I think would be really interesting. Fun. I can, I can always, you and I can always give the, our traditional uh, evangelical background views. Right. So <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm pretty good at those. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, Tom Ord is uh man, an author, a professor, and uh, he has written a new book and by, uh, Oh, I did the first interview I did with you is back in January 25. And so I want to encourage people to go back to that. And I did a, we kind of talked about your background and growing up and history and all that. We're going to skip that this time since we've done that once already, but I just want to refer good. to that because they can, they can go back and listen to that interview. And I, we talked about three of your previous books and um, we uh, kind of unpacked some of your theology around uh, open and relational theology, talked a little bit about the difference between relational, open relational and process theology and hunkered down on, uh, you know, the God of love, uh, mm. theology of love. And Tom is known as the theologian of love, <laughs> which I, which I, uh, I, lo I love that. All right. So, <laughs> but his new book is called the death of omnipotence and the birth of amipotence, amipotence, which is a word that Tom has made up. <laughs> That's right. He has coined a new word and we hope it sticks <laughs> and takes root and blooms and blossoms mm, around thanks, the concept of God. So I, I wanted to start maybe, uh, uh cause I, I want to dive into each of your chapters on the book, but I kind of thought maybe we would start with a bit of a pastoral. Mm, um, good sort of thought on the front just to, cause I have a lot of people who listen, who aren't, you know, scholarly, theological, you know, seminary trained people. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of just lay people. And I think, I think we struggle, people struggle. I mean, as a pastor of people for decades myself, and I know you've pastored people too, mm -hmm is the things we're going to talk about here on a, on kind of a, maybe on an intellectual level or really hit home deeply in the mm -hmm. hearts of people as they wrestle with life and circumstances mm -hmm. and suffering and, and God and how all that fits together and works together. And it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I, you know, I'm going to read a, I'm going to read a quote. <laughs> Okay. Big book of AA. Oh, nice. So, uh, cause I have a lot of recovery people that follow me too. Good. And I, I want you to know that the AA book, the big book it is like sacred scripture to the, uh, 12 step world. Right. Sure. Sure. Yep. So I almost come to this book like more, like I'm, I'm used to critiquing the old and new Testament in my scholarly studies you know, <laughs> and then preaching it, you know, all these years. But, uh, this, this paragraph I'm going to give you, and by the way, the big book, if you read it, there's times when 
God is very much Calvinist. There's times when God is very much Arminian. There's times when God is very much process. Bill Wilson and, and the guys that edited the big book, you know, weren't theologians. No. But the crazy thing is, is this is, there's over a hundred thousand AA groups in the world. Mm -hmm. It's been going since 1935 and it's still considered the best program to help people get sober. And that's not counting all the, the GA, the NA groups, the GA groups, the, yeah, yeah. you know, SA groups, all the different kinds of 12 step groups that there are out there. This paragraph I'm going to read you is literally one of the most quoted paragraphs in all of the big book. And it's helped millions of alcoholics, but we're, we're going to, what, and when I read it, you're going to have reaction to it. Right. <laughs> okay. And, um, one reaction I want you to do is from a pastoral level, critique it on how, how would this, how would you see this actually helping people? Yeah. And you might think about, you know, like uh, in all the evangelicals answers, we would give people to their suffering, right? Yeah. Well, it's just a mystery. And you know how that has happened. That's actually helped Christians through the centuries, right? Like there's yeah. a lot of Christians who've bumped up against the hor horrific pressures of suffering and they don't really know what to do with it, but they hang on to God and they just trust that God's got a plan in it somehow or another. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's brought comfort. Um, on the flip side, that same thought to some people has like gone, well, if God caused this to happen to teach me something, I don't want to have anything to do with that. God, that's like, <laughs> right. Yeah. God gave the Holocaust to teach the Jewish people some lessons. Uh -huh. What kind of God is that? Like, that's a God you don't want to worship, you know? And so that <laughs> these tensions that we face in actual human suffering and then how we try to find purpose and meaning and comfort in it, you know, theologically and community wise and family wise are really tough. So this is the quote and acceptance acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it is supposed to be at this moment. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake. Until I could accept my alcoholism, I could not stay sober. Unless I accept life completely on life's terms, I cannot be happy. I need to concentrate not so much on what needs to be changed in the world as on what needs to be changed in me and in my attitudes. That's one of the most famous quotes in the big book. Yeah, I like that quote insofar as it talks about how we should focus on what we can change about ourselves. Um, and I think what it's contrasting there is the idea that some people want to change everybody else and everything outside of themselves. And they don't look first at their own lives. Um, I don't like it. However, if it means that everything that happens is exactly what is supposed to happen, because that would assume then that my past choices were exactly what I should have chosen, which I don't think any of us actually thinks is the case. In other words, if I'm an alcoholic dealing with my alcoholism and I believe that my choices can change my future, I shouldn't think that my fa my past is somehow predestined or predetermined that I get to the place where I'm in now. So uh, I like parts of that quote and I don't like other parts. Yeah. Yeah. I felt the same way when I first you know, read it. And yeah. uh, of course my brain, I've had so much theological training. I tend to think about things theologically, but yeah. And, I, and I'd say my own, my own meltdown, you know, I had, I'd help people through suffering of every kind as a pastor for, for decades and tried to help people find, find God in the midst of their suffering. Right. Yeah. And of course, you know, quoting, Romans eight twenty eight, or, you know, you know, God, how God works in all things, which we would affirm. Right. But mm -hmm. we're not, we're not necessarily affirming that God causes all things. Right. Right. Such That's a big, big distinction. Right. Yep. Um, but pastorally, 
you know, it's people say, well, God's in control and you just got to trust it. And God's a big mystery and all the suffering that we go through, you know, you got to trust that God's in control. And there's some people that ends up working for them. They, they, they hang on to God and they get through their suffering, believing that somehow or another, you know, there's some kind of purpose in it. Right. Yeah. I'm not one of those people, but I do have heard people say that's the case. I've also heard people say that's the case. And then something pushes them past that. <laughs> so in other words, this seems to work sometimes for some people and then oh. it doesn't work anymore. Right. And like for my own situation, I, when I was feeling like an atheist after my own meltdown, well, I could blame everything on myself and my own bad choices. But mm -hmm. if you backed up 40 years and looked at all the people that God put in my life and my own mm -hmm. personality and, and the callings of God on my life. And if I, if I thought that God was in control of all that, put all these people, all these circumstances in place. And then I brought you down to my, my meltdown. It's like, it was like a divine setup for a fall. <laughs> it's like God made all this happen just so I would melt down and almost destroy my life and ever, and people around me. And I was, I, I literally like, I mean, like some of the people that, that deeply betrayed me had been in my life for decades and I would have thought God put them there, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I think for people too. And I just like, it was like, I always thought God was my friend and just so much fell apart. And so much of it looked like a divine setup to me mm -hmm. that I was just like, well, if God exists, which I was even questioning the existence of God, but if, sure. like, if God exists, well then pardon it. My like F God. I mean, I was so angry at a God who would orchestrate something like this. Right. Right. I was just like furious. Like I didn't want to have anything. Like all I want to do is cuss at a God like that. <laughs> yep. Yep. I totally understand. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what I'm, if I'm about, what I'm about to say applies to you, but to a lot of people, their view is they have a choice. Either they can believe God exists and God controls everything and it's all, everything's done for a particular purpose. And, you know, it's God orchestrates it to use your language or God doesn't exist or God does. God's got a total hands off policy and we're totally on our own. And I don't like either one of those options. As I say in this new book, it's, it's a choice people think they have between an impotent God and an omnipotent God. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a better way to think about God's activity in the world that avoids both of those. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm so on board. If I can, if I can help add my voice in any way. <laughs> I do Great. That. Cause, cause in my meltdown, I mean, and then coming out of it and being able to hang on to God, this, this is the only way it was working out for me in my own brain mm -hmm. and heart, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so let's talk the first chapter. You, you're talking about the death of omnipotence, which is the death of what? Tell people. Well, omnipotence is a classic word uh, from the Latin that literally means all powerful. It's the word that you would find in the creeds, for instance, the Apostle Creed, Nicene Creed, when it says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. In Latin, that would say omnipotent. And it's the word that uh, most theologians, when they're writing their you know, formal theologies and they talk about God's power, they want to say God is omnipotent. Now, what they exactly mean is not always clear, but I highlight three meanings of the word. Omnipotent can mean God exerts all power whatsoever. Omnipotent can mean God can do anything. Or omnipotent can mean God can control creatures or situations. And in this book, I'm rejecting all three of those views of omnipotence. All right. In your first chapter, you basically uh, do a breakdown on the biblical component to this and two of the two of the words in the Hebrew and then and then the the Septuagint the Greek word that's used to translate those two words talk about that yeah here's Shaddai, the interesting Sabaot, and pan pantocrator 
Yeah, it's an interesting story here. I think uh, some Hebrew or Old Testament scholars know the story, but it's not very widely known. And the story is that when we read the what Christians usually call the Old Testament, and we f- see a phrase like God Almighty or the Almighty God, we would think that somehow the Hebrew words that are translated God Almighty mean something like God having all the power or exerting all power or being in control. But actually, Shaddai, the first word translated Almighty, means either breasts or mountains in uh, the Hebrew languages. And the second word, Sabaoth, which is preceded by several Hebrew words for God, means something like hosts or armies or councils. So these words are li- literally mean something like God of the mountains, God of breasts, which nourishes and protects, or God of the armies, or the Lord of hosts is probably the, the best translation there. So you've got these two Hebrew words that when we read them in English, say God Almighty, and you're thinking, okay, how did this happen? How did we get such a radically different kind of translation? And the answer is that in the third and fourth century BCE, when Greek Jews are translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, they chose the word pantocrator that you mentioned earlier. Panto meaning the Greek word for all. Crater meaning something like hold, attain, sustain. So it would be mean something like God is all holding, which is still not omnipotence, but it's also not the breasted one or the Lord of hosts. And then this word pantocrater shows up in the New Testament only 10 times, but still it's there. Nine of those times are in Revelation, one in uh, Paul is quoting the Septuagint, but it's from Pantocrator then eventually Jerome, when translating the, the Greek into Latin, chooses the word omnipotent. So we go from the breasted one, the God of the mountains, the Lord of hosts, to the all holding one, to all omnipotent, all my, almighty, all powerful. Yeah, and... It's in so when, when when people say God is sovereign, it's just coming from the same same. Usually like, people mean slightly. that. Yeah. It's like it's just like the word omnipotent. Sovereign can mean so many different things. Mm-hmm. Some people say God is sovereign, and by that they mean God will guarantee to get the results God wants to get. Mm-hmm. And that either me- can mean God does it by controlling absolutely everything, which would be like a John Calvin God, mm-hmm. or it can mean that God you know, doesn't control everything. There might be some free will sometimes, but the really important stuff, God will make sure occur. So God occasionally controls And um, if sovereign is understood in either one of those ways, I want to reject sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Right. So your, I mean, your point in chapter one is basically that this concept of omnipotence is not a biblical concept. Right. Not only is the (laughs) word not there and the words translated almighty are mistranslated, but even the idea is not present in scripture. And And this, um, you know, some people's minds just go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that's an explosive statement for like, not only just lay people, but oh my yeah. God, how many, how many seminaries and theologians around the world would be on your doorsteps on top? <laughs> what, did you smoke some mushrooms? What's going on? How yeah. I'm sure this? there's going to be upset people, you know, and I try to lay out pretty clearly in the text. I mean, I, I obviously things can be translated in various ways, but I think I have some, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm quoting biblical scholars here. So it's not me generating some new ideas. Probably what's new here is that I'm uh, putting it together in a new way that I think will be convincing to a lot of people and be a real shock to lots of others. Right. Right. Well, don't, don't exit. Leave, read, read, stay on the plane and read the books. I would encourage you. All right. So I, I, I agree with you on your, on your biblical stuff there. So chapter two is, is I think really fascinating because you just dive into um, all the things that, uh, well, the title of the chapter, mm-hmm. death, 
what do you death by, death a, by a thousand qualifications? Yeah. Qualifications. <laughs> yeah. So well, even the thing, even the most conservative Calvinists, right? Yep. Still they will qualify, qualify omnipotence. Yep. Even the most conservative people in Christian history have said God is omnipotent, but you know, God can't do what is illogical. God can't make a married bachelor or a round square or God can't make two plus two equal 397 or, you know, those kinds of things. There's logical, ontological, mathematical contradictions. God can't do those. And then most of them also have said there are some things God can't do because of God's nature or who God is. So God can't tell a lie, for instance, because God is truthful. God can't stop existing because God exists necessarily. And when you start looking at some of these qualifications, you end up discovering that you and I can do things God can't do. Like you and I can lie and God can't. You and I can, uh, well, God's omnipresent, says most people, but you and I are not. Uh, so it becomes, you start to begin to think, okay, whatever omnipotence means, after you qualify it, you start uh, wondering if that's the best word to describe God's power. And then if you're someone like me and lots of Christians and you think of there's such thing as free will, well, then God isn't controlling everyone all the th time. So God doesn't literally exert all the power. Um, so that's what this whole chapter is about, listing over many, many examples of these qualifications, provisos, exemptions, exceptions uh, that not only have progressive, but also conservative theologians and philosophers have said when uh, have uh, given to omnipotence. Yeah. Yeah. Your first, your first one, God cannot do what is contradictory. Yeah. And I, I had a, I had, I was curious about. So um, one of the thoughts I had at this point was the the whole idea of Aristotelian logic. Mm -hmm. Our whole Western world is built on sort of an, you know, an Aristotelian logic. I, I remember even when I was doing working on my PhD, I had to, yeah, I, had to, I was reading Aristotle on logic, you know, and stuff like that as one of the, one of the things that we were doing. And I mean, PhD programs around the Western world are pretty much built on a, on that type of logic, don't you think? Yeah, it reminds me, I've forgotten the name of the person and even the century it was in, but somebody did a, a dissertation and the thesis of the dissertation was the law of non-contradiction is false. Now, the law of con non-contradiction says something cannot be both A and not A in the same meaning of A. So something, you, something can't be both A and not A. And the person then, you know, was supposed to defend this in front of his dissertation advisors, and they were supposed to call out all the problems with it. But everyone assumes this is correct. And so they have real no you know, logical grounds to argue against it. Um, so that's just a way of saying we all assume there's something true about logical foundations. We may not be able to articulate it well, but if you come across and say, well, logic is wrong, you'll end up using the very logic you think is wrong to argue your case. <laughs> yeah. So just for a moment. Um, so like the Hebrew mind, I think probably isn't based on Aristotelian logic. Mm -hmm. And I think the middle Eastern mind isn't probably that much either. Yeah. And I think there's a lot more uh, paradox and I think mm -hmm. paradox and contradiction are different. Yeah, me too. Okay. So, but for example, the Hebrew Bible is full of paradox. Right. And like, I mean, like, let's just take fair, a classic example. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Mm. And Pharaoh hardens his heart. Yeah. And the Hebrew mind is going, well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's exactly how it works. God's sovereign people have free will. Well, of course. I mean, and they might yeah. not have understood sovereign. I don't think they did understand sovereign. Like we, like you just described omnipotence. I actually don't yeah. think that was, that's not a Hebrew concept of God. No, I don't think so either. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I think that 
paradox is is an an, an intriguing thing. There's all kinds of paradoxes in the Hebrew Bible that aren't necessarily contradictions. It's not. That's right. Yeah. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. God didn't harrow, uh, harden Pharaoh's heart. You know that. Yeah. It's not a direct contradiction, but the idea that that God's action caused a reaction, or that Pharaoh's action caused a reaction, in the Hebrew mind, we go, well, of course. Yeah. Yep. In that particular case, you can talk about multiple kinds of causation. And so long as you don't think hardening of a heart is something that someone does unilaterally or single-handedly, then the paradox can make sense. Uh, once you start saying God hardened Pharaoh's heart means that God alone did it and Pharaoh didn't do anything, then you've got some problems because mm -hmm. the text then says Pharaoh did it. So, right. yeah, it's it becomes pretty complex pretty quickly. I think the part of that chapter, though, that I found like – most of what I'm doing in that chapter, probably two thirds or three quarters of it, I'm saying things that scholars have said throughout the centuries. In fact, I quote lots of people like Augustine and Aquinas and Peter Lombard and, you know, John Wesley, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm not giving lots of new things. I'm just kind of adding this stuff up and saying, look how many qualifications are being made. Mm -hmm. But if there's one original kind of move I make in that chapter, it's to point out that belief that God is an omnipresent spirit without a localized divine body, that is uh, something most people haven't really taken seriously. That means that you and I can talk into a microphone on a podcast and God can't. That means that you and I can chew a banana and God can't because God doesn't have a divine set of teeth. That means you and I can arm wrestle and God can't. There's lots of things that we as embodied creatures can do uh, that God can't do because God doesn't have a body. Now, it may be that God is calling upon us to use our bodies. And in that way, we can be God's metaphorical hands and feet. But that's different from God actually having a divine body to chew bananas, do podcast interviews or arm wrestle. And once you start thinking about those issues, you start realizing, look, when you're talking about these questions that have haunted people for ages, like why didn't God stop? that car from running over my son, mm -hmm. then you, know, you start thinking, oh yeah, there are some things that God can't do by virtue of the fact that God's a universal spirit without an arm to grab the driver's hand and, you know, make the car swerve. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I picked, you know, the incorp incorporeal, is that the right word? Incorporeal. Yeah. It's a hard word to say, <laughs> um, but you, you do point out that everything that exists has influence. Right. Um, so even a cell or even a rock or a, yep. a planet uh, exerts some kind of influence in the universe. Yeah. I mean, Plato's the first one to say that probably at least the first one recorded history. So I'm not I'm not the only one who's saying that, but I think that's generally assumed by metaphysicians mm -hmm. that you know creation has some sort of causal influence. Mm -hmm. And so God without a body, where where did, how does he influence? Right, and that's what I get to in the final chapter. I think that's the big question people are starting to ask when they're reading the second chapter and they're saying, oh, that's right. God doesn't have an arm to arm wrestle. Okay. Then how can God influence mm -hmm. us? Is this just like uh, God being the glue of the universe or like the force in star Wars, not really doing anything, but it's there and you have to have it. Uh, what classical theists might call a sustaining cause, or does God actually have influence? Does God have work, again, to use classical language, as an efficient cause in the universe? And uh, I'm going to say yes to that in the last chapter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, chapter three, you dive into evil. And uh, evil ends omnipotence. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, what, how do you define evil? What is evil? 
Yeah, my definition is that an evil event is any event that all things considered makes the world worse than it otherwise might have been. That's a kind of technical exam- language. So let me, excuse me, uh, point to some specific examples. Uh, just about every rape, rape I know of, uh, I'm tempted to say every rape, but maybe there's an exception, but just about every rape. It makes the world worse than otherwise might have been. Even if something good comes from the rape, like let's say a person is raped and they decide they want to start helping other rape victims, there's still that. So some good came out of it. That doesn't make the the initial rape a good thing. Right. So um, any act that makes the world worse than it might have been isn't a, a, a genuine evil. Okay. So has evil always existed? I think the possibility for evil is built into existence, but that's different from it, the necessity. In other words, creatures can choose other than the loving best God calls them to do in any particular moment. That possibility is always there. It's built into things because of, in my view, the way God creates. But that doesn't mean that evil is necessary or it's a, I, I also reject the idea that evil is like a thing out there in the world. I think it's a, a word we should use for events that make the world worse. So um, do, do, does everything that has influence have the potential to do evil? Probably, yeah. Everything that influences has the potential to do good and evil. Now, I wouldn't say everything that exists is conscious. So, you know, I doubt that worms have consciousness. I'm pretty sure cells don't. I'm pretty confident rocks don't have, you know, they're not choosing things. When you're driving through the Rocky Mountains this summer and a, a rock comes unhinged and f- and tumbles down the side of the mountain and crushes a car. I don't think the rock was sitting up there thinking, Hmm, should I let go now and crush somebody? I don't think there's consciousness going on, but that activity really did make the world worse than it might've been. Cause it, let's say it killed somebody. Um, so even chance events and accidents can be fortuitous, good or bad. Yeah. So do you have to have consciousness for moral agency to create evil? Yeah. So I would distinguish between doing evil and sin. I'm uh, from the Wesleyan tradition. I've always kind of like John Wesley's emphasis upon sin as being having an intentionality behind it. So that would be the kind of consciousness that you're talking about. But uh, sometimes I think people do evil even when they meant to do good. Um, You know, that's obviously a biblical theme. The story of Joseph is a classic example is his brothers meant to harm him by sending him into uh, by selling him as a slave. But they end up doing something good for the family because he of the way he responds. So, um, you know, I could give lots of other examples. But the the main point is I would want to say sin has some kind of intentionality behind it. I don't think rocks have have intentions, so I don't think rocks sin. Mm. But uh, yeah, so it's like there's there's these forces of nature and nature can be incredibly beautiful and awesome and loving and altruistic, but Mm -hmm. then it can also be cruel, like horribly cruel. Right. Right. Like nature's a serial killer death. I think death has always been a part of everything. Yeah. I mean, all the way back. Right. And there's good deaths and bad deaths. Right. I mean, sometimes it's a blessing when people die because they, they, my grandfather is an example of this. He suffered from dementia because of cancer. And when he died, everyone said good death. That was a good thing. Other people die in ways that we think, nope, that's evil. It shouldn't have happened like that. So death itself doesn't have to be evil, but uh, there's definitely good and bad deaths. Hmm. So nature can be cruel and evil. Unconscious nature or natural forces. Sure. I think natural forces can uh, bring about events that make the world worse than it might have been. Um Take the pandemic. Uh, I don't think the viruses involved in the pandemic have free moral agency. Uh, 
but I think our world was worse off because people died because of the the virus, the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's an evil thing. But as far as I know, no one committed a sin to make that a reality. Mm-hmm. So when we look at evil as it relates to omnipotence, um, what what are what are the choices that a person can make philosophically or theologically about what what is evil all about and yeah why is this such a killer to omnipotence yeah well it's a killer to omnipotence because lots and lots of theists both christian muslim and jewish folks have said god is all powerful god is omnipotent and then looked at the genuine evils of the world and tried to give some kind of an explanation for them that maintains God is omnipotent. So maybe they've said, look, every bad thing that happened is either caused or allowed by God to teach us a lesson, to build our characters. The problem with that argument, though, is that we can think of so many examples in which bad things happened and people didn't get better. They didn't improve. We're we're not better off. Or people might say, well, God's omnipotent, but God allows free will creatures to do things that are harmful. The problem with that argument, of course, is that we can see instances in which people use their free will wrongly. And if God has the power to stop them to temporarily take away their free will, then you think a loving God would do that. So the, the, the classic free will defense doesn't really do the job. And I could cite other examples. So the main argument for this chapter is we've got to give up on omnipotence. I've argued in chapter one that it's not in scripture. I've argued in chapter two that it dies the uh, death of a thousand qualifications philosophically. Mm -hmm. And now when we look at the world with all of its evil, we don't have good reasons to continue to think God is omnipotent. Yeah, I I I would always have used the free will defense for evil. Yeah. And, but you know, then you, you take it like Adam and Eve to me, or, you know, I, I've always believed in old universe, old earth. And yeah, you know, so, you know, if we're living in a universe, that's 15 billion years old. I, you know, I don't know. And yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there's been a lot of death and destruction way before us Homo sapiens landed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, even like, let's say if Homo sapiens are 200,000 years old on the planet, you know, so then Christianity has been exi- in existence for like 1% <laughs> of the history <laughs> yeah. of Homo sapiens. That's kind of interesting. And, and you think about, like, so God at the very beginning, <laughs> you know, starts these processes, I guess, of, you know, evolution mm-hmm. and all, it, all kinds of evil are a part of that process. Right. Right. If, if we stick with the evil as you've described, described it. Right. Yep. Yep. And so. I think that's why some scientific atheists just say, yeah, well, we don't need God in that equation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they've got a pretty good point. If you think God is omnipotent, because if God is omnipotent, God would seem to have the kind of power to occasionally interrupt those natural processes of evolution to prevent genuine evils. And yet that doesn't happen. So, um, yeah, you, uh, you wouldn't need the classic God in that sense. Mm-hmm. Now, there's still the questions of whether or not the good we find in the world is is explainable without God. Um, as I like to say, there's the problem of evil, but there's also the problem of good. Exactly. And so um, that's where I think uh, appeal to a God is important. But I'm offering a way to solve both the problem of good and the problem of evil by rejecting omnipotence and clinging to a God who is uh, who is loving. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm I'm like, well, if there is a God, this is, and and, you know, in my mind right now, this is the way it needs to work for my brain right now. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, so, and these you know, when you go back to these beginnings in chapter four, as you begin to try to unpack, well, what, what is this 
amipotent God, this God of love. So talk about what's your, yeah. your coined word. And then you kind of get into this, this universal mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. Pan psychism. And you're, as you talk about this God of love, because uh, I'm thinking about this from a, a 15 billion year kind of God and, right. and all these kind of things and these processes and natural forces and homo sapiens landing on the planet <laughs> yeah, <laughs> relatively recently in this whole mixture. And yep. Um, well, you know, as you know, I wrote some books in the past on the problem of evil. One of them was called God can't. And in that book, I really lay out what I think is a solution to the problem of evil in easy to understand language. But many people, when they read that book, they came away thinking, okay, God can't prevent evil single-handedly. So God's not to blame, but then they wondered, but what does God do? <laughs> what can God do? <laughs> and I wanted to write a chapter in this book that kind of lays that out. So I coined this word omnipotent, A-M-I meaning love in Latin, potent meaning power, the power of love, and not just any kind of love, the power of uncontrolling love as a way to talk about God's real, continued, powerful, loving influence moment by moment at every level of existence in every universe that exists. So this is no wimpy God sitting on the sideline saying, you know, good luck to you, Fred and Tom. I'm over here. I'm not doing anything. This is a God who's active and necessarily empowering and inspiring all of creation at all levels of existence, but never in a controlling kind of way. And that I think provides a foundation to begin to think about a loving God who's a universal spirit. And it actually fits really nicely with the general biblical witness. So what is, so at, at, at some point you start getting into, okay, well, if God exerts influence, what does that influence how does that influence occur? Yep. And even though God's spirit doesn't have a body, you still think that this universal mind can, that's not body can still exert influence. Yeah. So this is where we get really nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think of God as a universal spirit. And in the classic discussions, people have, gone this direction. They've said, yeah, God is spiritual, but the world is material. And humans are both material and spiritual. They might say we have spiritual souls and material bodies. But this way of thinking has really caused lots of problems, not only problems in thinking about what it means to be human, to have a spiritual soul, and how is that ever going to interact with a material body, but also, you know, if humans evolve in a long evolutionary process from the material world, then how does that spirit kind of somehow pop in there? And there's been proposals that God inserts a soul at some time in the evolutionary process. But then that raises all kinds of questions about supernatural interventions and why doesn't this God intervene to, you know, save us in other times? Um, and then there's a really interesting question that a lot of people don't really talk much about, and that is, how can a purely spiritual God interact with a purely material world? How's that really going to work in terms of your questions of divine action? Right. In this chapter, I draw from a tradition that's called panpsychism. Mm -hmm. And I say, what if we think that you and I and all of creation are comprised of entities that have both a material and a spiritual element, or I say material and mental element, so that our minds have both a physical dimension and a material dimension. Our brains, our cells, our bodies, everything that exists has both a material and mental dimension in varying degrees and complexities. And this is the real wild idea. The universal spirit we call God has both a material and a physical dimension. 
If that's true, then we have a conceptual basis for understanding how God not only relates to you and me, but relates to butterflies and cells and quarks. So we've got a framework for thinking how a universal divine spirit interacts, not only influences, but is influenced by creation moment by moment. I th- Big ideas. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if you go back the beginning of everything, it is substantive dualism basically saying there's mind and matter at the beginning of everything. Yeah. Well, yeah. Substance dualism says, yeah, mind and matter, whether or not there was mind at the beginning, you know, if you're a theist, you're probably going to say God was the mind, Mm -hmm. but um, you know, you could be in philosophy. There's basically four camps. The idealists say there's fundamentally mind exists and matter is Mm -hmm. either illusory or some kind of a byproduct of mind. Mm -hmm. The materialists say fundamentally all that exists. That basically says evil doesn't even exist if you take idealism. Yeah, usually it's, yeah, a lot of idealists think evil is an illusion. Right, right. Uh, Not all, but a lot of them do. Yeah. Materialists, they tend to usually dismiss God and think that everything is materiality, including our minds. Uh, um, Then these mind body or mind uh, material dualists that you mentioned, they usually think that uh, somehow everything is material until at some point mind either emerges in the process or God implants it. And then they usually have God as immaterial in a mind. I'm proposing a fourth model, which says we should think that everything that exists has some degree of mentality and some degree of physicality from quarks to quasars to the creator. And so um, with this concept, does, does panentheism help? Is that a is that a term that fits that idea? Yeah. It, yeah, it doesn't have to go with my idea, but it oftentimes is put together. Panentheism is the idea that God is literally present to everything that exists, and everything that exists literally influences God. Now, in order for God to be influenced, you'd have to think that you have to think about God's being, God's ontology as some kind of um, well, experiential dimension. And so the mentality side of God is, uh, fits nicely with the experiential side. Yeah. Which is different from pantheism. People confuse these two, I think, because they sound yes. so alike. Yeah. Pantheism says everything is God. I'm not a pantheist. Mm-hmm. There's no distinction at all. Right. You're no, very I think- much of a uh, relational God is re- relating to every part of creation. Yes. Every aspect of creation. Yep. All the time. All the time. And both are exerting influence on each other. Yeah, that's the big difference. I mean, lots of classical theologians, they'll say God is omnipresent, and they'll often say God exerts influence on all of creation. But because they think God is not relational, or the classic word is impassable, they'll say, but creation doesn't influence God. Mm -hmm. Then some relational theologian will come along and say, well, humans and higher creatures, they influence God, but not cells and quarks. But a panentheist wants to say absolutely everything, top to bottom, is influenced by God and influences God. Mm Mm-hmm. So when we're at our deepest, darkest moments due to evil, maybe that that we've chosen or maybe that other people have chosen that influences us, or maybe we were suffering from evil that was a part of nature, a tornado or, you know, a, a cancer or, you know, some some kind of suffering that lands in our lap without any kind of seeming like even moral agency, like a rock falls on you and kill, you know, or (laughs) takes your legs out or whatever. Um, How, how, what is this God? How does this God show up? This, this God who's not omnipotent. How does, how does this God show up in your suffering and what happens in those moments? 
God is present with us in our suffering and actually experiences our suffering um, in conjunction with us. And an experiential God who's affected by everything that happens feels our emotions as we feel them. And so this God truly, truly, I'll say, I'll say it better. This God literally sympathizes with us or if you like the word empathy better, empathizes with us. So that's one, a really important dimension. You don't, you never suffer alone if God is empathetic. Mm -hmm. But secondly, this God doesn't leave us in our suffering. This God works with us and creation to try to bring something good out of the bad God didn't want in the first place. When our kid dies of pneumonia, it's not because it was, God did it or God allowed it or it's a part of some plan, but God takes the tragedy, doesn't leave us in the ashes, and works with us in all creation to try to bring something good out of that bad. And that means because God is working with us, our lives truly matter. Mm -hmm. That's one of the big, I think, overlooked benefits of rejecting omnipotence. Mm -hmm. God's not omnipotent. Our choices affect the future and our lives matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the fact that that good does emerge out of evil and suffering uh, doesn't mean that God brought it on us to teach us, even though we might learn something from it. Right. Yep. That's where so many in the tradition, I think, have screwed things up. They've looked at bad situations. They've seen some good that come from it. And then they've made this intellectual jump. Oh, God must have wanted the bad in order for the good to come about. Mm -hmm. And I'm rejecting that view. But I'm still saying good can come about. And God works with us and all creation in that process. Yeah. You know, I remember memorizing scriptures as a teenager, like, you know, um, all, all discipline seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, but afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, you know? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And as a teenager, you know, I, you know, I was like, ah, well, you know, if I don't, uh, you know, do this and this and this, then, Hey, I might suffer for a little while, but this, or, but, you know, I had that idea that got, you know, all these circumstances or opportunities for me to, for God to teach me, yeah, discipline me, even, even if he was a loving father. But then if you start seeing all these evil and suffering as a, as, as a loving father do it, like, like if you're, if your kid, you know, forgot to take out the trash, would you give him cancer <laughs> <laughs> just to teach him a lesson? <laughs> I mean, but this is, this is how the logic ends up playing yep. out for this. <clears throat> if God, is giving your kid cancer to teach you parent something. And then your kid dies from that. What kind of loving parent would ever do something like that's a monstrous parent. It's an abusive yep. parent, you know? So that's where I felt so much, you know, in the darkness and, and the, you feel sometimes when you're in these places of suffering that God has abandoned you, you know, right. It feels that way. Yep. And then you're like, oh, and then God did this to me to teach me something, <laughs> you know, yep. like, like the drunk alcoholic father that's like, you know, off his rails. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that kind of logic ends up just falling apart. Right. And yeah. And there's such a, out, yeah, it's created a lot of atheists in the world. Right. Definitely. <laughs> that yeah. alone. Yep. The problem of evil is the number one reason that atheists say they, they can't believe in God. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found, you know, I've been thinking this way about God and evil and suffering for quite a while. And I found such psychological uh, benefit from thinking this way. Cause you know, it doesn't even cross my mind now when something bad happens that God is doing this or causing it or punishing. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have all those, those, I'm not doing that intellectual wrestling that I once did. I just assume God is loving me and with me and wants to work with me despite what happened. And I don't blame God. And boy, it's so much easier to think of God as loving if you don't think that God is causing or allowing evil. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I, that's, that's honestly, you know, where I'm at. And I, even when I wrestled with <laughs> my deepest darkness, I still like, couldn't, could not, not hold on to God. I just couldn't yeah. just been too steeped in it. And I've, yeah. I've prayed too many hours my whole life and like, well, maybe I was just praying to nothing all these years, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but no, but, um, I do, I think that the power of a loving God who is with you all the time, you know, the crucified God, yeah. who, um, who goes through all of it with deep empathy, pain and sorrow and suffering that's a powerful solidarity with God and evil and human suffering. And then emerging out of that, the, our relationship with God and our relationship with people help us rebuild our world after tragedy. Um, yeah, yeah. And we, do, we do see good come from it, right? When we, especially when we choose love and forgiveness and I've, I've Richard Rohr says, you know, that, um, as he sees it, our first forgiveness is toward reality itself for being so broken. <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> like he, he has this idea that we have to forgive almost everything mm. like that, because like there's just so much brokenness in the world. Mm. You have to pretty much let it forgive it. And that's where that radical acceptance I think comes in and a good yeah. way. Yeah, I can see that too. You no, know, um, you know, even in Buddhism, there's this idea of radical acceptance and yeah. um, receiving the moment and being grateful and thankful for this moment because really all we have. But then yeah. moving forward with that, the love, the solidarity, the hope that God brings into those situations, um, not, be, you know, it's a, uh, it's still my hope that through God and through community and a community of love and a community of, of God and love that we, we, we are there in our darkest moments for each other. Yeah. yeah um, I'm with you. Well, great stuff. I would like to say um, that I so appreciate your, your uh, willingness to press into this and, mm. um, take the hits that I know you take. <laughs> well, doing. thanks for the opportunity to chat about it, Fred. I, I really appreciate that. Um, your daughter and you have put out a book almost at the same time. Yeah. And so I want to just plug real quick. You've got, and you've got lots of stuff going on. So I want to encourage people. I know I had a lot of friends go out and buy some of your books already. So I'm. Oh, thanks I'm for spreading the that. word. But this is the newest one, the death of omnipotence. Um, you've got conferences going on. Uh, how can people connect with you? And then let's plug the new book real quick too. Cause I, I probably want to come back and talk about that one too. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, this book, the death of omnipotence, you know, you can find that in all the usual places online. Uh, the other book is called why the church of the Nazarene should be fully LGBTQ plus affirming. It's a collection of 90 plus essays, uh, it's a big book, and the essays are written by some by queer voices, some by allies, and some by scholars and leaders. And all of them are current or former members of the Church of the Nazarene. But you don't have to be Nazarene to appreciate the arguments and the stories that you find in the book. And uh, that's also available on Amazon and other places. Okay. But there's an online conference related to that book, May 26 and 27, I think. Okay. Uh, and you can find that on Eventbrite. Eventbrite. What's your website? My personal website is my full name, Thomas J J A Y Ord, O O R D, Thomas J Ord.com. So, uh, in the name of the, the LGBTQ book it's, it's a clunky name it's <laughs> why the church of the nazarene should be fully lgbtq plus affirming okay all right man what, we wanted to name the omnipotence just... and that one at the same time <laughs> yep so uh i i will i will pray for you <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate that 
I will pray for you. No, but thank you. I think it's important work and, you know, thanks Fred. People, people need to hear these voices. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much for, for, for doing what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. All right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning into spirituality adventures. I appreciate that you, uh, you joined us and be sure and read Tom's books. I want to encourage you to do that. Check out his website and jump in on maybe some of the conferences as well, too. He's doing great work, great stuff. And, uh, and I, I love the way you, uh, you have such a kind, gracious, um, delivery. Oh, thanks for um, So, so you have the, the theologian of love, uh, mm. has, has it's, you feel, it just feels like you're actually centered in that. Love. I'm trying to be. Yeah, yeah. Right. So appreciate that so much. Take care. Thanks everybody for tuning in. See you next time. This concludes today's episode. Thanks for tuning in and listening. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Remember to like, share, or subscribe to the social media platform that you're using. And then go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, and make a one-time donation. Or you can subscribe monthly and receive our special bonus content. Thanks so much.